Yes. Okay, guys, very good afternoon once again. I'm sure you can be a little louder. Not enough energy. Okay. I'm sure this, this place could be full of energy. Okay, say it once again. The back benches. <laughs> okay, why is calling sir? <laughs> I think I like that. <laughs> okay, uh, you know, it's a bit of an emotional connect. Okay, uh, exactly 30 years back, uh, I was a student in this city, you know, a few kilometers away. Okay, I was sitting exactly the way you are sitting, but uh, definitely not in this, you know, beautiful uh, kind of an environment. It was relatively a simple environment. Uh, coincidentally, I spent, you know, an hour, an hour, hour and a half, okay, with the students in the same campus before I came here, okay. Uh, it was, it was pretty emotional for me, okay. Uh, the reason is, um, I have been interacting with the students all over the country, okay. Um, I have interacted with students beyond India as well, uh, but never had the opportunity of interacting with students in Mysore. Okay, so thanks to you all. Okay, and uh, and I, I genuinely am very thankful. Okay, and I, I felt so comfortable and so delighted to meet you know such privileged you know um, leaders around here. Okay, it's very difficult to come across such large you know leadership congregating in an educational institution, and more so uh, what I consider a relatively small emerging city. Okay. Uh, you seems to be doing a brilliant job, fine, and wish you all the very best, okay. Uh, okay, uh, before we get on to, uh, I, I have been told pretty much like an academician saying do this, okay. <laughs> I think, but very much like a, a good student, I will not follow that, right. That's what students are all about. Correct? Are you with me? Yes. All right. Okay. There you go. Okay. Uh, but before we get on to you know our engagement for the next hour or so, um, let me do a quick introduction of myself because I did put Mrs. Us into a bit of a uh, difficulty. Uh, I graduated from uh, you know from the city, and I have worked over the last thirty years in various sectors. I started off with supply chain. I moved to FMCG, uh, then to telecom, okay, life insurance, uh, consulting, entrepreneurship, okay, retail. Uh, I consciously took a journey, okay, from one sector to another sector. Uh, I, in, during this journey, I worked for organizations right from, you know, the neighborhood, you know, Rangarao and Sons, okay, where I started as a management trainee uh, to TCI. Okay, Parles, PepsiCo, Airtel, Reliance Communication, Future Group, uh, Bombay Dying, okay, and my own small organization, okay. Uh, now, and, you know, the third thing which I did consciously is to move from a small organization to a large Indian organization to a blue chip, you know, blue blooded MNC back to Indian organization and then, you know, chose to go with startups, okay. Uh, the whole journey has been, you know, a blend of, you know, some go with the flow and also certain conscious decisions to take a certain path so that, you know, I acquire, you know, knowledges, okay, which cut across, you know, various sectors, okay, and various industries and, you know, different organization establishments, okay. Uh, that's a bit of my, you know, uh, corporate background where I come from. Uh, I'm supported by a small family, okay, uh, married to a good friend of uh, Kantraj, okay, uh, Chetana, she's a biochemist, a homemaker, and supported by two kids, a 19-year young, you know, second-year architecture student, a daughter, and uh, a nine-year young, you know, son who actually keeps me young both at heart and health, okay. Uh, that's that's about me. Now let's let's come to the the subject. Okay, I'm being told that you know let's talk about future of retail in India. Uh, 
my you know i have not come prepared with any presentation neither i have any slides okay nor i have any pointers okay uh, the reason why i'm doing so is i firmly believe you know they you are used to too many lectures okay and you don't need one more is that correct what you probably need is an interactive you know engagement are you with me yes. okay so the more you boil me the more you get out of me right okay so to that extent i think let's talk about it okay uh, I, i i seek leaders from you to you know pose you know questions and whatever you want to understand you know from me okay on this whole subject now if you are spilling beyond that subject don't worry okay i think let's keep it re relatively with your due permission i think let's keep it relatively open okay so that you know there is a mutual learning for both of us are you with me yes. yeah okay cool now i'll uh, let me start off okay i think this whole retail industry uh in india in particular has gone through an evolution okay it continue to go through and you know there will be many more levels of evolution uh you know you are all relatively young uh, but if you have read history and if you go back to let's say you know how india was um two decades back okay two two and a half decades back india was all about traditional trade you are familiar with traditional trade hello sorry okay any anybody else what is traditional trade sorry yes the kiranas okay what we call as in familiar term kiranas okay see india unlike a whole lot of you know uh countries elsewhere in the world india is a country filled with entrepreneurs when you don't find a job what do you do open up a kirana store are you with me okay you are uneducated what do you do you just open up another stall a tea stall okay a laundry store okay a convenience store a medical store a cloth merchant okay a barber shop are you all with me yes. familiar yes. now that doesn't happen okay in a uh, you know in many other parts of the world okay so india has been influenced by you know an intrinsic urge to be an entrepreneur and that's not because you know you want to be an entrepreneur but you are being forced because of your ecosystem okay so as a consequence you know india has been largely driven by traditional trade there are no estimates even by the finest of the fmcgs companies okay on how many traditional trade uh, you know stores exist in india but i you know any number can actually put put the count upwards of you know 10 million stores in india which is by far the largest anywhere in the world okay now if you the reason why i said 20 years back this country was filled with only traditional trade you look at any category okay you look at the apparel category it was small stores okay you look at the groceries okay there was certain you know small departmental stores or the nearby kirana what you in uh, you know um, maybe kannada has no relevance for all of you okay in the kannada la you know colloquial language we will call it as a kaka shop okay so you know it that's that's what india was all about okay now there was no technology okay there were no processes okay there were no systems and it was invariably led by one entrepreneur supported by maybe one or two assistants that was you know the traditional trade for you i think with the invention of you know startups like big bazaars okay and followed by a whole lot of other shopper stop etc etc okay and you know the mnc is coming into india around 20 years back is when the modern trade creeped into india you all understand what is modern trade 
Anybody? What is modern trade? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. Take another call. Organized retailing. Okay. Unlike a traditional trade which is led by an individual, an individual entrepreneur, an organized trade is a multi store, okay, a, a, a trade which has chain of stores spread across a larger geography, connected by IT infrastructure, run by professionals. Okay. So, a traditional trade is a one store management. Now, he, you know, Max, he would have actually you know, one chemist would have actually opened up probably two, three more chemists, but it was not in IT in, uh, connected. It was not run, you know, in a manner where he could actually seamlessly look at the inventory. Okay. It was not run to an extent where he could actually read through who the consumer, what are the consumer behaviors, when is the consumer walking in, why is the consumer walking in, why the consumer is buying a certain SKU. You all understand SKU? Yes. What is it? Awesome. Okay, good. Now, so you know, some 20 years back, okay, modern trade creeped into India. When, is this part of your education or is it? Uh, uh, no. Yes. I want to hear you guys. Yes. Yes, All right. Okay. So there was this, you know, sudden fear saying, you know, look, modern trade is going to take away jobs. Modern trade is going to kill the entrepreneurship of this country. Modern trade is going to actually, you know. Uh, you know, basically hurt, find you know the sentiments of economy. Okay, but what happened was com completely opposite of that. Okay, modern trade, you know, came into India, took its own time. Okay, and gradually started impacting the whole economy. Okay, what are the changes which modern trade did to the country? The first thing which they could do is to you know scale up the employment. Because if you notice today, you know, irrespective of wherever you live, okay, uh, the ones who have been, you know, were born and you know, and part of this country, okay, you probably would notice, you know, the neighborhood kirana which you saw right from your childhood days, okay, probably still exists. Are you with me? And it is possible that the number of chemist stores which you saw in your residential colony have only multiplied. They haven't come down, okay. Now, what does it mean? India as a country actually gives opportunity for coexistence. And that's exactly what you know demo got demonstrated. So modern trade came, okay, you know, provided new employment, created organized supply chain management, large warehouses, well connected, you know, the the feeder routes right from manufacturing on to the uh, you know onto the, the point of sale, okay. And you know, leveraging you know the IT infrastructure to you know deliver a better customer satisfaction. Okay. So while modern trade did that, okay, the tra traditional trade coexisted along with that. Why did they survive? Why did traditional trade survive in this journey? Okay. Okay. All right. There is one thing which they do very well, traditional trade. There is one thing, there is only one word. There is one word. Convenience. Is there anybody from Mumbai? Great. You all know. You know, you call up the guy the Kirana guy and say, look, I need, you know, aloo samosa, okay, at 10 o'clock in the night, it will come. The bill value could be as small as, you know, 50 buck. I, are you used to in Mumbai? Yes. I live in Mumbai. 10 years I've been in Mumbai. Okay, I am literally a Mumbaiker as much as a Mysur, Mysurian. Okay, the sheer convenience which a traditional trade does is, you know, just incomparable. Okay, now he will open the shop if need be. He will open the shop at eight in the morning. 
if need be, he will open the shop at you know 10:30 in the night. But that can't be true for an organized establishment. Okay. If need be, somebody spread, uh, you know mentioned about credit. Okay. You know it's it's fine. You know I, I would I would actually use the jargon in my you know corporate language. Okay, on the back of like the way you call back of the envelope. Okay, a lot of kiranas would actually write on a piece of paper. Kata, right? So you know the credit extension, etc. So now what did did this in the second stage of retail evolution? Okay, it demonstrated to the country that you know both traditional and the modern trade could coexist. Okay, and both of them could actually prosper, and you know offer distinct value to the consumers modern trade offers experience for you okay why do you go to a nice looking you know air conditioned store you go for experience okay you you like window shopping okay you uh, you you like you know the various payment terms etc etc which they offer okay the sheer convenience why do you go to a traditional tra trade you want to pick up your toothpaste you want to pick up your brush Okay, you want to pick up your, you know, the, the the daily needs. You just walk across to the nearby store. Okay, you just pick it up. Both of them coexist, right? And that's that's the second phase of journey which we have gone through. Okay, now the third phase of journey which we have been witnessing in India today. What is that? Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Okay, go ahead. What else? Okay, all right. So you're right. It's it's you know this invention of you know online, invention of you know reaching your doorstep. Okay, you know it is it is no longer you know you need to you know take that pain of actually walking across. It is about you know it's it's a distinction between you know physical versus versus click. Okay. So, you know, the third, this, this particular, you know, evolution, okay, is not led by India. It is a global evolution which has been happening, okay. The difference here in this particular phase is India is not far off, okay, from any, any part of the world. If you see Amazon doing something in US, okay, it is just a matter of, you know, days and weeks before the same happens in India today. You see an Apple getting launched, okay, Apple products are getting launched newly, okay, in, in New York, okay, the, you know, probably it's no different for Mumbai, you know, and a, a week later the same happens in Mumbai, okay, the product is available any which way, but physically also it happens. So now, you know, the third phase of, you know, evolution which has been happening in, in India, okay, in the retail space is influenced by, you know, global shift. It is about connected, you know, retailing. Okay, irrespective of wherever you are, I'm sure today most of you okay buy a whole lot of stuff online. Okay, it's you know Amazon's and the Flipkart's and the Mintras of the world. Okay, the big baskets of the world are nothing new to any of you, because you probably know about them much more than I. But the key is not about the front end of the business. Okay, the front end of the business is what you are all familiar with, because you are all witnessing you know what's ac exactly happening. The key is to know what's actually happening in the back end back end of the business the back end of the business is you know significantly changing okay have you ever been to any of the amazon warehouses anywhere in the world have you okay you know if you ever get an opportunity you should actually go and see the amazon warehouses okay they are immensely large they are out of the world scale, unthinkable in terms of the sheer scale. Okay, they run into you know millions and millions of square foot, and minimal on the human intervention. Managed by robots. The whole you know right from you know the the, the moment the the product gets into the warehouse till the moment it gets shipped. The whole processes, there are multiple levels of processes, inverting, okay, repacking, unbundling, you know, repacking, billing, and then shipping, okay, a small packs, etc., etc. 
okay everything invariably is managed by machines that is no longer you know managed by human. Now, that can scare some of you okay because you may have the fear saying you know what happened to the job market okay it can be a huge opportunity as well for some of you okay. So, that is one piece of shift which has been happening in the back end of the business because I I'd rather do not want to speak about the front end in the third phase of evolution because all of you are used to uh, um, I, are we together okay am I boring all of you no. the smiles are lost get the smiles back on your faces yeah the key you know that is one you know shift which has been happening in the way the warehouse operation. There is another major shift which is happening in the way the sourcing is done. Okay. Given the fact that you know now we live in a very connected world, okay, you do you want a certain product, you want an uh, you, you want an Apple watch, okay, and you see that you know you are not getting the latest model in India, okay, you want to source it, you are okay to actually pay that extra import duty, you can buy online today, correct. Okay, you want a you know 42 mm GPS plus cellular? Yes, you order it Amazon. Okay, and it will it will come you within a week or uh, ten days. You know with the import duty. Now the point is the key is not that. The key is how is the sourcing working? Visualize the sourcing about agri products. Okay, now there is a huge revolution happening in the whole sourcing world. Okay. If you, if any, of, is there any agricultural student here from agri background? Okay, not an issue. You know, agriculture in India is the most complex and the challenging space. Okay, fragmented industry, fragmented, you know, producers. Okay, now the sourcing historically was always led by multi level, you know, middlemen. You all understand the middlemen? Okay. So, there used to be multi levels. Now, all those multi levels are getting converged, they're all becoming seamless now. Okay. The reason why they are becoming seamless is when you every time when you actually look at a certain discount, okay, you are delighted that you know you are getting a certain discount on the product. Correct? I think the fundamental question which you probably will have to ask is how is that brand or an organization able to you know deliver the discount to you there has to be some you know optimization somewhere right are you with me that optimization is largely happening in you know the back end okay like warehousing the sourcing the supply chain management etc etc okay if you ever get an opportunity as part of your internship or as part of your research etc etc i would strongly recommend you know go across you know and understand the agricultural sourcing for, for that matter you understand agricultural sourcing you will get to know your apparel sourcing easily the finest of the apparels which you all wearing okay it has gone through a tremendous amount of sourcing you know evolution for example, you know the company where I, uh, you know the company which I ran a couple of months back. Okay, I went and actually shut, you know, the manufacturing base. Okay, you know I shut the oldest, you know, textile manufacturing company in India. 137-year-old factory. Okay, we decided to shut. The reason was very simple. Okay, we didn't find, you know any longer viability of running that manufacturing facility because a, a whole lot of smaller units okay had mushroomed and they were capable of actually delivering a similar quality okay at a lower cost for the simple reason they were not actually producing it for one person they were contract manufacturers for 100 others okay and they were all well connected okay right with the end users okay as well as you know the middleman so we had if i if i had to compete okay with somebody else okay i can't be actually sitting on a white elephant called manufacturing factory okay it's a white elephant now when i knock that off okay i'm i'm in a better position to actually offer a value products to you okay at a relatively lower cost 
okay, and probably better quality as well. Now that's that's a relatively simpler thing what I'm saying, but you know, in the third uh, you know phase of Indian retailing, I think e-com is dramatically changing you know the entire sourcing you know arena altogether. Okay, so that's that's what. Sure, sure. On a, on a lighter note, that's why it said die. Yeah. I go for, I mean, I still buy the Bombay uh, towels and uh, bed sheets even today, going yeah. to the same store because of the quality. Yeah. But I'm not too sure if it is kind of, you know, sourced to different. It's the same small unit which caters to all other brands. Because this, out of experience, I have come back to Bombay Dying because yeah. I found that compared to others, it's still I still have a 30-year-old, uh, you know, bed sheet with me, yeah. which yeah. still is good enough, yeah. except that I'm bored of the design, maybe. Yeah. So I am not too sure whether you will be able to have that distinct quality if you change that model. That's my question. I think it's, it's a fair point. Uh, but however, I would like to you know expand the scope beyond Bombay Dying onto what's really happening in the whole manufacturing space. Okay. Uh, see, manufacturing space is going through a couple of you know significant shift. Okay. Number one shift is um, manufacturing can't be any labor intensive anymore. Okay. Uh, the second shift is you know you need to build scale. Okay. Thus, you cut down your costs. Okay. You need to scale it up significantly. Okay. The third thing which has been happening is you know historically when you had captive manufacturing capacity. Okay. Irrespective of whether you are your utilization is 40 or 60 percent, you are burdened with that because it's captive for you. It's invested by you. Okay, but today you know that fundamental has been questioned. Okay, saying you know if I have committed a certain investment, it's very important for me to actually you know throttle it to a level of 85 percent plus or a 90 percent plus capacity utilization. Now, coming from some of the, the these shifts, now, how you know if these shifts are real, and if I as a brand owner, okay, there are two questions which I go through. Question number one is: Should I be investing in the consumer-facing part of my business? Okay, as a CEO of the company, I think my fundamental question is: Okay, should I be investing on the consumer-facing? Should I be investing in the back, you know, the backward integration of the business? It's simple answer. I think between these two, I think the first question for the answer is very simple: invest in the consumer. To do so, now I need to actually pass on, you know, the the manufacturing to somebody else. Now, if I have to pass on and still ensure, you know, the reliability of my brand, the quality, you know, promises of my brand, how do I ensure? Which is actually done very beautifully by the FMCG organizations, the FMCG brands. You might be very surprised. Uh, amongst all the women here, you know, you you might be wearing a lot of nail polishes. Okay. What if I told you, okay, nine out of ten nail polish brands, okay, which are sold in this country, are invariably produced only in two or three factories. I'm not joking. Now. You will be shocked. You go to a factory, you see brand A on one line, you see brand B on another line, you, brand, you see brand C on another line. But in your mind, your brand is the most you know, preferred brand and your brand is the most unique brand. Do you know where, does, where is it getting manufactured? Do you have any idea? Are you even interested? Yes, yes you know, when you have product challenges. Yes, the point I'm making is I think it's a very important point which you raised. Now, I'm, I'm taking the nail polish as an example. I, mean, I can actually talk about the biscuits and I can talk about various others. Okay. Uh, now, while a brand A versus a brand B, first of all, you know the product specifications are different. Okay, the packaging specs are different. Okay, 
Now, what does it mean? In the same factory, while you know you are producing different brands, it is all about the quality compliances which matters. It is about quality adherence which matters. Okay, so that's how the organizations when they outsource it, okay, they actually build a robust you know quality compliance and the quality adherence team. Okay, now what if if I have to say that you know today three fourth of PepsiCo business okay is not owned by PepsiCo in India? Do you believe it? What if I told you okay? 80% of coke business globally is not owned by coke can you believe it you don't believe it coke doesn't produce itself 80% of coca cola is not produced by coca cola company itself okay but the coke or a pepsi which you drink which you have grown with you have built a certain taste to it okay the same whether you buy it in mysore or you buy it in mumbai the same and that is because whether it is not about the production unit it is about your quality compliances it is about your quality promises it is about your robustness of the organization yeah so that is that's a that is a phenomenon right now that is leading into another thing okay this is you know the, the other as part of this whole shift okay which in the in the third phase which has been happening is you know the private label fine you know uh, um, private label infusion into the business i don't know you know particularly amongst you know amongst the the f the women segments okay uh, most of the apparels okay which are sold are private labels because men you know segment has been relatively branded for ages uh, are you with me okay because if you ask men you know which are the most popular brands which you are used to what are the brands which comes to your mind levi's arrows okay etc uh, etc et right okay but let's talk about women apparels okay zara h&m are all new okay they have just walked in okay only w okay so uh, you know the, the man used in women etc etc these are all relatively new but you know what how much of uh, you know mintra's revenue come from private label do you all buy on mintra how many of you raise your hands okay great you have okay just tell me what percentage of mintra business come from private labels 40% Mintra would probably clock 1.2 billion dollars, you know, when they close this financial year. Okay, 40 percent of the business would come from private labels. Trent, have you heard of Trent? Have you heard of uh, you know West Side? Yes. West Side, have you heard? Yes. Brilliant. Tell me what percentage of business comes to them from private label. Any guess? Anybody who did internship with Westside, Tata's? Westside is, you know, amongst the retail space. Do you all read, uh, you know, PNL, the balance sheet? How many of you own shares? How many of you invested in stock market? One. Raise your hands. Either it's halfway means you just started, is it? Okay, fine. So there are some of you. Do anybody own, uh, you know, Trent? No. Okay, fine. West Side, you know, is probably an exceptional retailer in India. Okay, an average apparel retailer, or for that matter, any you know grocery retailer and etc. etc. They make anywhere between three to four percent, you know, margin. Okay, West Side has been consistently, you know, clocking upwards of eight, eight, eight and a half percent margin. The reason is simple. 80 percent of their merchandise is private label yeah it's as simple as that now this shift okay is is significant which many of us are no, not noticing 
because when you walk into west side you think it's just another brand the fact of the matter is you know it's largely private label okay so it's you know it's it's just another mini china okay because china is all about you know so many private labels fine uh, that that let's let's leave it there i think that's the third phase of you know um, uh, you know evolution in retail i think the key is to now talk about you know where is this leading what's the fourth you know level of evolution which is again now it's no longer india because india and globe is one and the same it's just converged into one single market okay we are you know we are in a phase you know which is you know what you call as a global economy irrespective of whatever trump would actually do okay uh, you know irrespective of what few leaders would attempt to you know make their economy a protectionist economy okay that aside okay you can't walk away from the fact that it's a global economy it's a global village okay we are just one world so what do you think will be the next round of evolution in retailing sorry okay what else ma'am you have been very active i have to say that i i i want the students to be active as well they probably are not enjoying what i'm you know, you know what i'm talking to them yeah <laughs> so what's the next round of evolution in retail sorry okay sorry come back okay what else there's one word there's one word which will define that okay there's still one word okay which will define the next round of evolution giga factory what is that uh, okay no There's still one word. There you are, machine learning. Okay, I think that's going to change the whole world. You know your whole shopping experience, your whole retail experience. Okay, in the coming month, not months, coming years. Okay, will be completely led by machine learning. so much of work which has been going around the data science okay where you know you will be dissected into what you are who you are what are your age groups what are your demographics what do you what are your likes what are your dislikes when did you visit you know when did you click on something when did you go where who did you interact with okay what are your likes dislikes what are your engagements on the social media etc etc all converged into a very complex model called machine learning and that machine learning will actually lead into you know what is called as predict predictable retailing the future is all about predictable retailing it is no longer about you know what you call as an impulse retail or a need need based retail today we are largely into either a, either a pre planned need based retailing or an impulse retailing when you go and actually do a lot of shopping etc window shopping or otherwise okay the future is all about predictable retailing machine will predict and say it is this is what you want okay it is almost you know to a stage of prescription okay whether you like it you don't like it okay it is machines are going to be intruding into your life that's the big shift which is happening in the retail space okay and that's not restricted to let me tell you that's just not restricted to um, you know the so called high end you know consumer goods okay etc i think it's going to happen across all sectors okay that's one big shift okay i see the second thing i i clearly see is um, uh, i honestly have no idea whether you you study the urban and the rural markets okay uh you have any such thoughts in terms of what's going on in urban rural india 
Uh, any idea what percentage of Indians live in rural markets today? Okay, any other number? Okay. You know, the uh, a recent wor you know, uh, World Bank and IMF study said less than 30 percent of India you know, lives in rural markets. You are shocked, which is just the opposite of what we always believed that you know, what India is all about. Okay. Our own you know, data, okay, the, the Indian data okay, continues to say that you know, India is an agri market, India is influenced by you know, rural, 70 percent of our population lives in, a, in rural, actually it is no longer a fact. Okay? Because the urban centricity which is happening around the country is phenomenal. Okay? The rural jobs are dying. Okay, people are moving into urban markets. Okay. What does it mean to retailing? It basically means retailing in itself will go through a shift. For example, one of the shifts which you are going to see given, given the urban, urban markets are getting condensed and condensed and you know, space is becoming a crunch. Space is, space is a massive, massive crunch. Okay. Because if you have to open up a retail store, the first thing which you ask for is there a parking space. So, very basic. Okay. If you do not even have a parking space, you know, if there is a parking space, that particular space is premium. Okay. The second is in, a cit in cities like Mumbai, okay, if you have to acquire a 1000 square foot shop, it costs you a million. Okay. It is expensive. Now, but if you have to you know, have larger stores, so, where, where is the space? So, what is the next round of shift which is happening is you know a whole lot of industries will move beyond you know the what you call as either central business districts okay, or the, the key you know urban markets. For example, you know car retailing, there is no reason for a car retailing to be in the city. Are you with me? Okay. Car retailing needs large space. Okay. So, and you know it is not an often visited place. So, they will move away from the city. Car servicing, automobile, okay, you know the brand factories, whole lot of them will geographically shift because they need large spaces. You know anything to do with your furniture stores, okay, who calls for million square foot you know spaces, they will all move away from the cities. Okay. It will have a larger impact on the economy in itself it will actually con, you know help the rural and the urban convergence faster okay so there are there are many many things okay which are going to happen but i think the bigger one to my mind is the machine learning which will dramatically change you know where the way the industry you know the whole retail industry is going to uh, evolve uh, it will knock off you know a whole lot of what we perceive as a requisite job today Okay, um, I think I probably would like to stop here and give some time for Q and A. Yeah. Open for questions. Yeah. Sure. Good afternoon, sir. Mahesh here. Uh, you spoke about machine learning and the evolution of artificial intelligence and how retail is going to be more predictive in nature. Uh, but isn't that already happening? For example, if I click on an Amazon page and navigate to a different page, I still can see a small icon or a thumbnail of the product that I was looking at, and they are trying to coerce me passively to buy it. So, when you mean evolution of this further, uh, yeah, it's it's. You're right. It's happening, but it's just the beginning. Right. So from here, it, it will it will go, go to it will go to a level, okay, where you know when you walk into an Amazon store, okay, or uh, let's say for example when you go go to Amazon Go, right. okay, right. you know which is which is just recently opened right. up, right. okay, you know probably a screen will tell you, okay, based on your you know you know your various social factors and your purchasing behavior exactly what you are looking for, okay, and that's going to happen. Okay, you you know it will not be a surprise. Okay, 
if today, I mean tomorrow, one of the e-com companies will actually tell you, saying, you know, this is your, you know, regular needs, you know, for your livelihood. You don't even have to think. Right. right. That's going to happen. Whether you like it, you don't like it. Whether it is intrusive, okay, or not, that's a fact of life. Right. Machine learning hasn't reached that stage yet. But I can tell you, the kind of investment which has been happening in that space is billions and billions of dollars. Okay, uh, you know, just last month I was in New York and I met one of these, you know, uh, young company called Fuse Machines. Okay, uh, founded by a young, you know, Columbia University professor from Nepal. Okay. Okay. Those guys, you know, they have employed 200 engineers in Kathmandu. Okay, which is shocking. 200 engineers in Kathmandu. Okay, and they have employed another 300 engineers in uh, you know US and elsewhere. Funded by uh, funded some hundred hundred million dollar plus. Okay, what they are doing today is like for example, they are predicting accidents, road accidents. Can you believe it? So that will dramatically change the whole insurance industry. Now, today insurance industry is flooded with uncertain claims. Okay? The moment fuse learn uh, fuse machines or anybody for that matter will actually you know will evolve this model to a level of actually predicting you know uh, accidents, okay, predicting deaths. Okay? Uh, I, it's an unrelated example I'm giving, but that's what machine learning could actually do. Okay, so many more things are going to happen. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Risks, health risks that they hold. So there is a big debate going on in that space that you know it shouldn't be going to that level. I probably agree with you because I think I'm I'm only referring to you know what you know human mind is working on in terms of leveraging the machines. Now what will get implemented, what will be ethical and unethical obviously you know is a larger subject to debate because I, you know I would not like to know when will I die. Okay, I would rather like to know you know how how can I live you know every day. So I completely agree. But in terms of the back-end work which has been happening, it's enormous. It's mind-blowing. I think the way these guys are, you know, investing in terms of, you know, they are trying to actually dissect you and me into bits and pieces. And that's a fact. In addition to that, I think it's already happening. Predictive in the sense, not the individualized one in the entertainment or content and some of the including Amazon. For example, now they know the preferences, let us say for a black, uh, I mean, uh, computer, laptop, sleeve or whatever, that's yeah, the most yeah. common, Amazon is producing it. Yeah. Similarly, Netflix, for example, it knows the preferences. Yeah. So it's no longer a channel to distribute content, but it is also a production unit. Now they're producing exactly. TV shows based on the preferences of I yeah. mean, the collective uh, preferences of consumers. I agree. So, in I a way, agree. probably, my question is that, in a way, you are going back in a way, back in the sense, let us say something like a Netflix, which became only an aggregator, right? It was the prime. Now, it is also a manufacturer, a producer, let me put it that way, at least in the content industry. Now, coming back to the textile industry, there is a point that you know the preferences of what kind of things will sell. Mm -hmm. So such platforms would get into production as well, right? Just as Netflix has gotten into. See what now? I think you said it very rightly because you know somebody starts as an aggregator and then he becomes a manufacturer. When he becomes a manufacturer, the need for another manufacturer to coexist. who are in the music world equivalent of Netflix, etc., etc. See, they all become just aggregators. What are they doing now? Aggregation gives them the strength to know the consumers better, unlike a cinema producer. Cinema producer, he produces one movie, he rolls it, okay, he made his money or he lost his money, but he has no consumer insight. But to say, either it's bombed or it's rocked. There's nothing else, right? If it is ro rocked, 
he, he has money. If he has bombed, he does not have money. But whereas a Hangama or a Savan or a Ghana or a Netflix, they have you know the wealth of data. See, this world is all moving towards you know, it is like you know, people say that you know, the future will be fought on water, future will not be fought on oil, the future will be fought on water. I think equally the future will be fought on data. You have data, okay, you will be chased. That has become the strength. So I, I think that's that's what is happening, okay? Because you know data can be mined in different directions. And having mined the data, and then finance is easily available today. Since finance is easily available, okay, you know, creating another factory is that much easy. Have I a uh, little? Okay. It, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. You can see what happened to the, the, the taxi, um, you know, the app taxis, okay. They came as an aggregator, right. Today they are no longer just an aggregator, they are financers, okay. They are recruiters, find their trainers, okay. They change the ecosystem, okay. They are making the life of that, you know, driver respectable. The driver was never a respected job, okay. They are making the, his life a respectable job. Okay. So, I think those are the changes which are going to shape the economy, I mean global economy, nothing to do with us. Sorry, sir. Oh, yeah. I, I have the mic, so let me go ahead and ask a question. Forceful? <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, it's great to have an insider from the retailing industry on stage. So, I just could not resist this particular question. Uh, we as consumers are fairly exposed to consumer promotions. Yeah. And I was fascinated to hear what you said about private labels. So, if I am not a private label, I am a brand, a national brand, say, uh, what can I do to uh, market to the trade? What kind of promotions, uh, and does data analytics help there? Because we are all been talking about data analytics as a wonderful thing for uh, identifying and uh, cross dicing uh, the cust customer for the customer promotions. Uh, how can that translate to what we do to the trade promotion side? Sure. So what's, sure. what's going on there in that world? We don't see that as sure. consumers. Sure. So I'm, I'm Okay. Let, I, I think there are, there are two pieces to your question. Okay. Question one is, you know, how do you do this whole consumer promotion? And the question two is, how can we leverage data to do so? Okay. Now, I can probably answer this in very, you know, with a simple example, okay. You can see today, um, particularly when you look at the consumer industry, okay, uh, more so anything which is of instant gratification, okay. Um, everyone is moving towards discounting and discounting. It's, it's either buy one, get one free or an X percentage, etc., etc., okay. And uh, that's obviously, call, you know, actually chasing the eyeballs, which is fairly so. There's nothing wrong in that. But however, the key, you know, for a um, head of marketing or a head of brand is to, you know, break away from the clutter and create a distinct identity, okay, uh, while he is compounded with so much of clutter around him. Now, how does he do? will always come from consumer insight. Okay, for example, I will quote example many years back, okay, Mountain Dew. Okay, have you heard of Mountain Dew? Yes. Okay. Now, I remember, uh, you know, we were going through this challenge of actually, what do we do with Mountain Dew? How do we position this? Okay, it is just another, you know, in, in our internal jargon, we would call it as another sugar water. Okay, just another soda, right? Okay, uh, but you know, it has this neon, you know, look, okay, uh, very vibrant, okay, and uh, it, it is, you know, obviously can be positioned, you know, towards the youth, okay, who are, you know, different. And then, you know, one insight, you know, which we were debating on, how do we define youth? What is youth all about, okay? Uh, now, when you define youth, the fundamental question which we were going through is, should we, there are two models, okay. One model is to actually pick up what the youth is today, 
okay or the other model is to also look at some unexpressive you know uh, uh, imageries of a youth okay which can be the future okay so what turned out was the research inside basically said youth you know just want to be daring they just don't you know they don't want to be you know constrained okay in the past okay and they have no fear okay but because india because we are influenced by the parents because we are influenced by the society okay then you had to converge the two that's when we said you know let's actually change this whole thinking dar to hai mere dil mein lekin dar ke aage jeet bhi hai right because see the fear do all of you understand hindi yes. how many you don't understand hindi i can see two of you who else three how many don't understand hindi i can actually translate that for you dar is all about fear okay it's very natural right all of us have fear fine so we actually picked up that consumer insight and said you know dar ke aage jeet hai <coughs> dar is natural because when you saw rithik roshan if some of you remember that you know piece okay and you saw rithik roshan i think he doesn't know how he doesn't know swimming okay he is shit scared to dive okay but his friends say chalo yaar let's go okay let's let's jump fine and then he comes back and actually picks up this dew and says let's go okay so you know it is you see you know again you know ahead of the fear okay dar ke aage jeet hai now that those insights are critical to actually make that consumer marketing okay stand out in a clutter because you know then you build then you build a whole lot of you know go to market as once you have your thoughts right then the go to market in terms of reach out programs you know reaching a certain tg etc etc then there are a lot of campaigns which you build both btls atls and others okay that's one part of it now where data comes into play when you do a okay, when you do a research like that if your uh, hypothesis which you are building that dar ke aage jeet hai okay if it is not substantially backed by data that yes there is something going on underneath okay there is an undercurrent amongst the youth that i want to do well i want to fight you know fight my fear okay i don't want to be you know bounded within a box okay unless the data actually you know gives you that confidence you will not jump into because it's a, it's a big call which you're taking okay because particularly when you do you know i'm not referring to only consumer you know promotion i'm i'm actually linking that to the brand positioning in in itself okay so that's where you leverage the data as well yeah have i have i answered your question yes. Okay. Hello. Students all want me to sleep. <laughs> Very good afternoon, sir. Yeah. Uh, so my name is Rohit. Uh, so it was yesterday when uh, we read this uh, article in Economics Times uh, that Walmart is taking controlling stake in Flipkart, which could be around 26 percent. So a brick and mortar retail company by this will enter retail market. So how will it change the landscape of retail in India? Uh mm huh. -hmm. Is that a question or is that a like, uh, uh, is that a news news clip which you want to read out? No, is like question. A question like, how do you think it will change? Like with Walmart coming into India with the help of Flipkart. I think the key which you need to understand in that is even before we answer. See, Walmart has been the single largest retailer on the on the earth. Okay, what they built is unthinkable. they built scale they actually challenged you know certain you know models historically okay they made it huge okay that's one one fact the second fact today walmart you know valuation okay is probably 120th of amazon or probably even lesser One third is it? Oh, sorry. My apologies. Okay, great. Okay, 
you've been tracking okay my apologies okay so but it's significantly low in terms of business revenue they still have a decent revenue okay much higher but in terms of valuation it's it's a, it's a, it, it just an adverse scale okay now what's happening is there is a huge shift okay from offline retailing to online retailing okay now there has been a problem okay which is nothing to do with walmart alone it is true you know globally there are no, there are no success stories so far are no proven stories to say a, a, a successful offline retailer has also become a successful online retailer there are no stories to demonstrate okay or large business houses okay who have been successful elsewhere have been successful in online there are no no such things to demonstrate for example you know in a uh, back home okay ambani stride okay online okay they shut okay birlas you know ago they tried they shut okay now so given that background because the dynamics are very different the models are unique so walmart is actually now looking at out of sheer frustration with no choice no other choice given a choice they would have bought amazon can they buy amazon now they can't buy amazon okay so they have to buy flipkart now so that's that's the second fact now the third the real question which you are asking is how will this impact okay now what it does is actually like i think you kept talking about omni channel omni channel right i think that is exactly what's going to happen because see today uh, you know online retailers who started off as online they opened up you know offline you look at lens cart okay uh, you look at mintra fine they started online they got into offline okay vice versa is also true okay you look at big bazaar largely a offline retailer moved on to online why this you know this convergence will happen is because if you have to impact the lives of a consumer you can't be choosy on the channels of trade unless you are a, a louis vuitton okay who actually prefer to do only one kind of you know more, uh, you know retailing okay luxurious great stores consumers walk in only once once in probably once in a life or once in you know many years okay so to that extent i think this is definitely going to help you know both walmart and flipkart for walmart it's definitely going to help in terms of actually getting a threshold presence in online it's also going to help them in terms of sourcing because flipkart with 23 warehouses okay large you know probably now i don't know how many maybe a million vendors etc etc they have built a large sourcing network so that's going to come on the board of walmart how will this have an impact on the indian retailing space it's definitely going to uh, you know impact on the smaller players okay for example where the combined might of walmart and flipkart could be hurting everybody including big bazaar the paytms okay um, and a whole lot of others okay because then it is a question of actually you know who will garner more and more in future investments you have to understand in retailing you know two three critical things retail is high cap capital intensive labor intensive low on margin the retail is all about you know defining volume versus value okay when you talk about you know mass products okay it is all about high volume business low margin business okay so that's how it's going to make a difference it will probably you know kill you know few as and when that happens yeah yeah sure so yeah yeah please go ahead i can take another yeah another 10 another 15 minutes yeah yeah sure uh, sure sure yeah so uh, your you started off your talk by saying that it's all about convenience which matters when when a consumer is buying a good right and in the end uh, you ended by saying that most probably all these brand factories all are going to you know like shift to the rural side part of it 
So my question is, once they shift towards, okay, even if they are coming up, they'll have to come up in the most of the metro cities only. It's not going to mostly go to tier two or tier three cities where there are no people to buy. So it has to be built somewhere in a in a metro city. So traveling is again an inconvenience. So will these shops be more for B to B or B to C? B to C, I don't see a chance because again convenience matters. People would rather go to a brand factory which is near by, which is around 10 kilometers next to my house, rather than going really far away. No, I think the you know both of them are slightly you know disconnected. I think you you link you know two disconnected subjects. Okay, when we spoke about traditional trade, we spoke about convenience. Yeah. Okay, that's not going to go anywhere. Okay, that's going to be your neighborhood kiranas, your neighborhood chemists, your neighborhood tailors. Okay, that's going to remain like that. Okay, because they they don't call for large investments in neither in space nor in labor. Okay, nor in the machinery. Okay, okay. so that's not going to change. when we spoke about you know the urban to rural you know convergence okay in the future what we spoke about was you know specific industries which call for large you know geographical investment okay moving away from the towns okay for example okay if you are uh, if you travel to mumbai okay there is a place called bivandi have you heard of it <laughs> okay Now, if you go to Bivandi, Bivandi, you know, happens to be a very large logistics, you know, uh, uh, where warehousing space. But along with warehousing, there are uh, hundreds of large furniture shops which have come up. There, are those furniture shops need, you know, areas which are running into probably one lakh square foot, or probably two lakh square foot. Now, where do you find it in Mumbai? Number one. Okay. So, first of all, you can't find it. number 2 is obviously you don't find such spaces with you know at a low low capex unless you get into a, a mall okay and malls are expensive you can't afford because business will never be in a position to afford the third is these are also called destination shopping because you don't go and buy furniture every day are you with me yes sir so yeah? basically talking about certain sectors certain categories okay it's not going to happen You know, across you know, basis. grocery stores are not going to get you know be put up in Bivandi. Okay. okay, grocery stores are not going to come up on Nanjan Good Road, right? Because grocery stores have to be here. Fine, but a car servicing center can be away in the Nanjan Good Road. Okay, on the Mysore Bangalore Road. Fine, so that's going to happen. Thank you. Yeah. Back benches. All right. Hello, sir. Sir, as per your previous answer, uh, in that you told uh, retail businesses uh, have uh, it's it's based uh, on low margins. So, how do you define like uh, many many retailers are uh, on in online shopping like a big billion sale of Amazon? Like they give up to eighty percent of discount. So, how do they subsidize the, uh, that that much amount? And uh, what about their offline stores? So, what what impact is it creating on that? Yeah. So, you know, um, we spoke about grocery margin being very low. Okay, not the entire retail business. Okay, so grocery obviously operates on an extremely low business, but low margin. But if you get into apparels, etc., etc., they operate on a pretty decent margin. Okay, where the margin could be upwards of twenty, twenty-five percent as well. Okay, uh, but having said that, I think discount is a phenomenon. okay whether it is a billion uh, you know a billion day or x y z i think discount or you know what you call as end of end of season sale okay have you all heard of eoss yeah okay that's that's you know that happens at least thrice a year okay now the way the model works is in invariably there are three stakeholders in such discounts okay so one is you know aggregator himself in this case flipkart as an aggregator okay third is you know the front end you know vendor okay which is you know that particular merchant uh, merchant who is selling okay and then the in you know the then there could be manufacturer now typically you know all three come together and share the cost 
Now I'm sharing insights. Okay, this is not something which you read in books. Fine. So when you actually get into such roles, you will start understanding. You will actually break the cost. Okay, and then you make every stakeholder a partner in that. Number one. Number two is. You know, every time you actually do any such, you know, initiative, you look at a certain, you know, it, it is incremental revenue versus incremental cost. Have you have you studied marginal costing? Yeah. Now, what does that mean? It basically means while you are seeing as a consumer a seventy percent off, in reality. There is no seventy percent outgo from my pocket because I'm generating a substantially higher revenue. Okay, on that my marginal cost is much lower. Have you have you heard of this co you know company called Nearby? Groupon. All right. So how do they manage discounts? Huh? Is it like a quantitative game? So, low margin and very high quantity. Anybody else? How do they manage? Nearby, Groupon. What's their business model? How do they? How do they buy inventories? How do they give it to you at a discount? You know, you you go to you go to a Hyatt Regency, yeah, you know, and uh, these guys are saying, okay, in, you walk into a Hyatt and get. Fifty percent off on a buffet. Okay, you go to a Leela and get, you know, fifty percent off on a uh, on a buffet. How do they manage that? Is it because of uh, bulk booking? Yeah, you are pretty much there, but I, you know, you are there. Yes. It's just not about bulk buying. It is about buying surplus inventory. Yes. It's not bulk buying. There's a difference between bulk buying. Bulk buying is I come to you and say I buy on wholesale. No. It is about you know like okay let let's take this example, okay. Now visualize you know this is okay. Visualize this is a cinema hall. Okay, hypothetically. Now I have you know forty percent seats vacant. Are you with me? Yes. I have forty percent seats vacant. Now I see this trend over a three months, four months. Certain show, okay, morning show ten thirty. Forty percent seats always vacant. Okay, what do I do? I sell that forty percent seats. Okay, at a fifty percent discount. Okay, but that so that's called surplus inventory load off. Okay, but it also they have some model like uh, the days on which they give and something of that sort, like the time uh, period they have again. Yeah, that that that's what I said. You know, that's where data comes into play. But the way you know these models work. Okay, coming back to the big billion day, what happens is, you know, the big billion day will help you offload lot of unsold inventory on you. Okay, now lot of you know, if you are particularly if you are in an apparel business, apparel business, you know, if is there anybody from fashion designing here? Anybody from NIFT kind of background? Okay. Anybody from textile engineering? All right. Okay. Now, if you come from an apparel business, globally there are three seasons. Right. Okay. In India, there are two seasons. Okay, which is nothing but summer and winter. Now, apparel business is such a business. You know what you, you know what you produce, what you design today. If you don't sell it off in the next six months, it's gone. Okay, because particularly you ask the women folks, they don't like to wear what her neighbor is wearing. Okay, I mean men are okay because men anyway is the same shirt, same pant. Okay, you know as long as it's whites and whites and blues, it's fine. For right, but that's not true for women. Okay. And in fact, the women have become more conscious on their children these days. When women buy for their children, they definitely want their children to be different from other children. Okay. Now, what does it mean? It basically means uh, there is a large unsold inventory lying at any point of time. 
Now, what does holding inventory mean? There is a cost. Okay, the cost of holding an inventory, you know, if Flipkart walks in and says, "I'm going to knock it off for you," will I not give away the whole inventory to Flipkart and say, "Go sell it"? Okay, I will actually give you give you at eighty percent off. Done. Okay. Yeah, yeah. How does the franchisees get affected during that period of sale? I think mean, that is what yes, yes. the last point of this uh, question was. No, uh, so your previous experience, how would you handle this kind of? Uh, no, you mean you basically mean offline stores, competitors. Right. Okay, not franchisees, because if it is my own franchisee, then he's part of my chain. Okay, whatever I do, anyway, he's also part of it. So, to that extent, you know, he doesn't get impacted any which way. But if he is like when a big bazaar does a billion, you know, day sale or X, Y, Z, how does it impact, let's say, a big bazaar, okay, or a shop or stop? Is that your question? No, no. Okay, Bombay Dying stores. Okay, okay, fair, 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 fair. It's simple actually. In case if we have made a certain offer to uh, Flipkart for that period, the same offer is given to my stores as well. So he's not getting impacted. Of Absolutely, because it's it's like actually treat you know treating all children equal. Okay. All right. Simple. Yeah. Okay. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, according to recent Economic Times article, I have read that uh, the Indian retail is growing rapidly around 60 percent and they are going to hit 1.1 trillion US dollars by 2020. So it looks like huge opportunity for young entrepreneurs to get into retail. So what could be some of the barriers of entry according to you? Well, I think the barriers are plenty, okay, because uh, you know whether it is retail or any business for that matter. Okay, you know what comes to your eyes are always the barriers. You know it is the capital. Okay, because it's retailing is all about you know it's a capital intensive business. Okay, it is equally labor intensive business. Okay, uh, depending on the category which you choose to. Okay, you have to define on whether it is a volume driven or a value driven business. If it's a volume driven business, it's low margin. Okay, like the groceries, medicines, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, but if you are into value driven businesses like the apparels, okay, wrist watches, perfumes, accessories, okay, they are all high value businesses, okay, with high margins, right. So, I think, you know, the barriers are relatively simple, okay, it is also very competition intense, okay, uh, very, very competitive, okay, unless you have a, dis you are able to create a distinct identity for your product, okay. Uh, you will just be another commodity, fine. Actually, there is nothing wrong in being a commodity because if you go around the US grocery stores, okay, uh, there is ev you know everything is sold in uh, as a commodity as well, okay, uh, which is true of India today because all the medicine uh, have, have turned out to be generic as well, okay. So, there is nothing wrong in that, but the question is you have to choose whether you are creating a brand or you just want to be part of the commodity market. If you are part of the commodity market, then you know you don't even know who your competitor is, okay? And you are operating on an extremely thin margin. If you want to be part of that, you know, distinct brand market, okay? Then you need to have a powerful brand. Then comes the investment in brand as well, okay? So uh, the payback in retail business is a bit of a question mark, okay? It takes its own time, okay? It's just not easy. Fine. But having said that, I think if you have a great, a unique product, okay. Uh, for example, you know, in US, I met one of these guys. You know, they are, you know, very simple product. I'll, I'll just give you an example. They have created a, a waist, okay, with ten different pockets, right? And uh, you know, ten different pockets. You know, the one can actually, it can take an iPad. Another one can take a phone, okay. Something else can take your you know x y z stuff okay de depending on men and women okay simple product but the question is is it unique okay can somebody else copy it the next day 
okay when you look at a zara okay which um, you know zara products are simple okay affordable what is that's not the difference in zara the difference is their ability to churn the product portfolio they churn it you know the best in the world that's the reason why their you know revenue throughput per square foot is the highest in the world okay and even h&m does that but they have not been you know able to actually compete with those guys fine okay so there are lots of these elements in uh, in retailing you need to think through I, I think I, I probably answered that, that question. Uh, um, you know, if you if you want to be a retailer, okay, I think uh, there are key questions to ask. Uh, you know, which product segment are you choosing? Okay, um, why would you like to you know work in that product? How pro how unique that product is? Okay, um, understand the the competition landscape today. Okay, and visualize the competition landscape tomorrow as well. Okay, because uh, you know, see, uh, I think there are certain you know, you need to also think through in terms of what can prevent competition to get into that space. Okay, which is very very important. Okay, uh, because there are certain businesses where you know, a me too you know models can just open up the very next day. Okay, you start something today. Okay, you know suddenly tomorrow you go around and actually see there are ten others. Okay, who just started off. Okay, because it's there are no entry barriers as well. Uh, so you need to think through right on that, and of course you stretch your capital. Okay, because I can tell you with a little bit of experience, I'm also a failed entrepreneur. Okay, uh, because uh, I'm, I'm, you know, there's no hesitation in me saying I'm a failed entrepreneur. Because entrepreneurship is not, uh, I'm not discouraging any of you. Okay, I'm not ne neither actually uh, scaring any of you because that's that's what we should be doing. Um, we should all explore. But the key is before you jump into entrepreneurship, okay, stretch your financial aspirations as well. Okay, um, because with a little bit of experience, I can tell you, I ventured into entrepreneurship. Because I had this dream saying, you know, I should retire by the age of 40. You know, I should I should be spending six hours in the golf course, okay, at the age of 40, okay, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. I had all what you know the best of the dreams, okay, but the worst of preparation. And that's not the right thing to happen, okay. So I didn't have enough you know capital to sustain the business, right? Because at a certain age you need to take care of your family as well. Okay, so maybe at when you are young, I think uh, you have the luxury to probably give in, give it, give that you know four five years. Okay, yeah, take a chance. Okay, when when your hair turns grey, so <laughs> probably it's not so easy. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, sir. Uh, sir, you uh, mentioned uh, a lot about. Uh, Sorry, I'm missing the face. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Huh. <laughs> Uh, so my name is Nikhil. Uh, so you uh, talked a lot about big data and data analytics and how uh, online retailers use this information to study consumer behavior. Uh, but sir, so do other online businesses as well. They use the same amount of data to you know uh, help their business. So, so my question is, do you see other businesses, say like uh, Ola or Uber, entering the e-tail space? Uh, and in, and if they do. Uh, do you think they are better place compared to brick and mortar stores to adapt to the Indian, you know, e-tailing space? See, I think the you know these um, you know these possibilities of expanding the scope of business, okay, will always exist for everyone. Okay, Uber walked into Uber Eats, okay. So whether Uber Eats has done well or not, okay, one doesn't know. Okay, Ola experimented few things as well. Okay, grocery delivery. Okay, so they experimented that. Now, uh, coincidentally, the Ober, o, you know, Ola COO was my young management trainee. Okay, just for your information. 
okay vishal call fine one brilliant you know management trainee with me in pepsico so um, the point is i think you know there are lots of these you know explorations which people keep doing okay i don't think anybody uh, anything will stop them because they have a wealth of you know data uh, on their side okay now how they leverage what they do they can be okay i'm sure they will be fine so yeah yeah, yeah absolutely not. Okay. Okay. Uh, you have a celebrated brand uh, like uh, bomber dying and you also have no longer oh uh, okay yeah uh, sorry okay yeah yeah uh, you also have a loyal customer like shall we okay now uh, my question is you said that you shut down the uh, factory factory okay you integrated the back end okay how about the front end which wherein I believe you know more than 70 percent of the uh, purchases or the consumption of Bombay dyeing products are mm -hmm. done through the network of stores mm -hmm. right okay mm -hmm. uh, uh, more more than the e-com e-commerce uh, mm -hmm. stores mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. okay now what is it okay I, and as you rightly said that our focus should be more on the consumer side yeah and what what is it that a brand like Bombay Dying is due to is doing to drive the customers to the stores? See, um, the product category, like uh, the one with in which you know Bombay Dying is okay. Um, we call that as a, a pre-planned you know purchase category. Okay, um, driving consumers in a pre-planned purchase category is lot more difficult than an impulse category okay because impulse category has this advantage of you're walking across the road you know you get influence you get you see something you you just buy in okay etc etc so to that extent you know there are a lot of window shopping happens in a category like uh, you know you know thing about actually there's nothing called a window shopping okay there's zero window shopping because if the customer as well you know comes into your store it means he or she has decided only if unless and until you discourage the customer will buy <laughs> okay so the conversions are you know in bombay dying the conversion is 90% uh, okay so to that extent yeah i'll i'll come to that yeah. i'm coming on to that yeah. okay what do you do right ah uh, i run a, i run india's first omni channel marketplace sure okay uh, which one uh, it's called city on net uh -huh. i digitize the entire city right, right right okay i drive customers to the city. sure sure okay uh, i also uh, give, uh, I'm working with the MIT professor, okay, Massachusetts Institute of Technology professor, uh, to drive uh, customers uh, to Kirana stores across the globe. Okay, and along why a professor to drive consumers? No, uh, he he had he had written a case study and he was interested in knowing more about us. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, also, a little bit of consultation sure, sure. with Walmart also. Sure. Sure. Uh, is this? Fair enough. Basi yeah. Basically, okay. in the interest of the can uh, students who yeah, yeah, are yeah, learning, yeah, this, yeah, that's yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. My question is, you know, like for example, you you just mentioned that, uh, you know, you shut down the stores and Shalini Ma'am had the question, you know, what about the quality issues and other things? Okay. Uh, apparel as a category is generally a, a touch, feel, and buy experience. Uh, okay. Un unless you get the a uh, real discount in a retail shop. So you generally go and pick it up. Okay, so uh, basically what uh, the focus next as, as the re retail, fo focus of retail should be the online to offline. Okay, that's uh, exactly something like the new retail that is being done by Alibaba. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, that is, uh, that generally is looking at coming up in India also, like Tata Click is already thinking about doing it, mm -hmm. right? Okay, uh, certain so probably brands. Probably I'm, I'm, I'm lost. Okay. What's the question? Okay. No, I'm the sorry. question is, I'm, I'm, uh, yeah. what, what, how, how does Bombay Dying drive a customer to the store? Yeah, I was, I was coming yeah. on to that. Yeah. Okay, I think, Be the, because so I was about to. digitally influenced consumption is about $500 billion. Okay, it should not be driven only to flip cards and other people. No, 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 yeah. no. Let, 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 me, let me articulate mm -hmm. that. Okay, the, the starting point which I said is, you know, every upper, uh, I mean, every category 
okay has to start to begin with has to define itself okay who the consumer okay where where is the point of influence okay, okay. and you know how to influence that right. consumer okay now that varies from category to category okay now in this case in the in the in, in the bed linen etc the so called home furnishing case okay i think first of all we work on the consumption occasions okay what you call as consumption occasions there are plenty of them okay to name you know some of them for example you know we work very closely with you know the builders okay we know very well that you know when the new home you know you know purchase is happening right. okay we also work very closely with you know the asian paints equivalent okay the painting community okay because you know that you know there is some renovation which has been happening okay so you know then we work you know co marketing etc etc okay that's one piece of it the second piece of it is we constantly go back okay to the database we dig into the database we mine the database okay and constantly remind the consumer on festivities because festivity in india has a relevance for you know renovating your home okay now it i'm not saying you know we have done well in all you know all such yeah. occasions yeah. i'm only saying these are the possible occasions okay marriage is another significantly huge occasion okay it is marriage both for marriage consumption or and also gifting consumption perfect okay so it is so one is actually called the you know per consumption led you know promotion okay which is occasion led promotion okay that's one part of it the you know then the second is uh, what we call as premise marketing okay which is called on premise marketing how many of you know on premise marketing okay fine uh, this is where the difference between you know st education and you know practice come into play okay uh, no the sale point of purchase sale is different from on premise marketing yeah so what we you know you do on premise engagement for example on premise engagements in a store like bombay dyeing is you know for example you know generate excitement around the kitty parties in mumbai okay because kitty party means it's women folks Absolutely. and the right you know tg for us yes okay because one woman buy you can influence 10 others it's very easy okay because so then you know one woman buys then others say okay chalo you know i'll also buy something right uh then you know we run on premise programs around the the school children okay because influence the school children you have a phantom you have a uh, you know spider man you have a pokemon you have xyz okay you have those caricatures and others okay put them together build on premise excitement right uh so this is the second okay we have marketing then the third is you know and just you know it's it's all about actually drawing the footfalls okay because see on, in a retail business like ours okay higher the footfall okay it's an assured revenue for us because we know that you know the conversion is going to happen okay now so there you know there are various initiatives we constantly work which is called a merchandising calendar okay so you will have a merchandising calendar okay backed with these event calendars okay for example christmas okay during christmas okay you just change the whole you know decorum of the store okay and you also ran a santa you know program around that Absolutely. okay so like that you know a good organization okay um, i i would say theoretically a good organization backed with a great uh, you know capability will have calendarized programs so retail organizations are backed with you know you have the merchandising managers okay you have the category managers okay uh, you have you know these event managers all of them come together they build a program they calendarize it over a period of you know typically they run it for two quarters okay uh, some of the global organizations they have calendarization over you know a good four quarters mm -hmm. okay so that you know because it's 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 a it's all about style statement absolutely okay since the styles keep changing because see our styles are not influenced by us okay for example our styles are influenced by what happens in france or hong kong okay because those are the two big markets fine because we invariably go there study what what are the trends 
okay you know is it is it the jakaz which is you know which is going to happen is it uh, you know the floral okay is it uh, you know just you know some other you know design okay which hong kong and france is recommending then just we pick it up okay come back customize it to india okay then you know put the whole piece together yeah thank you so there's a lot of you know yeah. lot of back end which happens actually yeah, yeah. Uh, right yeah. uh, so it's it's uh, yeah yeah okay great yeah 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 i probably will have to rush now okay i think i hopefully i'll make it to the airport yeah okay Thank That's you, it? sir. Yeah. Now I would like to call Dr. Sudhir Rao, Professor of Information Systems, to deliver the vote of thanks. Yeah. Um, distinguished Chief Guest, Mr. Rajana, Trustees and uh, Board of Administrators of Myra, my fellow faculty and my dear students, as uh, Professor Shashadri correctly pointed out, we are really lucky to hear from an insider about retail, though we study in the class. Here we are able to hear from somebody who is an insider to the industry and the insights that he has to offer. Um, first of all, Mr. Rajendra, uh, Rajana, you really have given us a good evolution of how the Indian market has uh, evolved. And uh, not only that, uh, I would say you have taken a big risk and projected into the future also, which we academicians are normally wary of projecting into the future. But that's probably what is going to be of most useful to all of us students here, especially. And uh, one more thing uh, which was very notable was that in the retail, the front end has gotten very glamorized thanks to all the venture capital investment and all those things. But you began your talk by focusing on the back end. That's something that all of you students have to take it with you. That the visible part, the visibility comes from the front end, but the effectiveness is driven by the back end. Probably that's the secret of Amazon and to some extent Walmart also. So it was very critical that you pointed it out to us. And um, also as you mentioned, talked about evolution, uh, you also pointed out what are the things to focus upon. For example, focus upon the customer end. And also not to be left behind, as an IT person this is important for me, not to be left behind by the trends in IT which are driving these things, like artificial intelligence, analysis, how these things can help us change.